The Introduction to Edgar Allan Poe. Before we move into the works of Poe, I want to take stock of where we are in terms of the development of fiction in the 1830s and early 1840s so we can better see how Poe will continue some traditions and change others. In the stories we've looked at so far, we can see some similarities. One, readers in the early 1800s are not particularly interested in contemporary American settings, but origin stories about America have a stronger appeal. Young Goodman Brown focuses on the Puritans in Salem, Massachusetts in the 1690s, well over a hundred years before the author of that story was even born. And Rip Van Winkle focuses on the foundings of America as an independent country. That story, too, was set before its author, Washington Irving, was born. In both cases, it appears that the intrigue of history in the early 1800s holds a stronger fascination for readers then than the intrigue of the present. 2. Both Rip Van Winkle and Young Goodman Brown touch on romantic interest in nature as a place of personal knowledge far from the overwhelming impulse of the city. Both of these stories are focused on central characters leaving town and going out into the woods where the interesting things happen. 3. Both of these stories focus on unusual, or what I might call, non-centrist events, such as sleeping through a war or meeting the devil in the woods. And four, both of these stories are arranged around non-fiction style arguments. Rip Van Winkle wants readers to reconsider the social cost of the American Revolution in terms of free time, leisure, and community. And Young Goodman Brown wants readers to reconsider the identity of the early European immigrants of Massachusetts. One of the large takeaways for readers after finishing both stories is a transformed understanding of historical events. But even between them, readers can see significant developments in the art and craft of fiction. Young Goodman Brown, published in 1835, is far better paced than Rip Van Winkle, published in 1819. Goodman Brown has full scenes with vivid details. Its characters engage in complete conversations with well-directed dialogue. Its plot, too, gradually works with escalation to reach the pinnacle of drama at the story's conclusion. Edgar Allan Poe would continue using some of these craft developments for this new form called fiction, particularly the rich sense of detail and plots arranged with a gradual increase in dramatic tension. But generally, he felt that authors up until this time, such as Washington Irving and Nathaniel Hawthorne, were looking at the wrong models to advance American fiction as a literary form. Irving and Hawthorne offered readers the benefits of nonfiction inside of a narrative. Readers received research, new information on historical events, and an argument focused on how best to interpret the past. This was largely head knowledge. These stories offered readers information and perspective, but Poe felt that instead of following the lead of nonfiction, fiction should create dramatic moments that advance the materials of poetry, allowing readers to have secondhand vicarious sensations of romantic ecstasy and romantic agony. In other words, he was interested in conveying heart knowledge instead of head knowledge. Poe, of course, was personally interested in that latter option, romantic agony. His stories, at their best, use detail setting, the sound of language, and plot to create dramatic moments in which readers experience notes of terror, horror, foreboding, grief, sorrow, and existential sadness. That is, he felt a successful story should be arranged toward a unity of effect, a set of details that, working together, directed readers toward a predetermined emotional experience. Readers rarely learn much of value in a story by Poe. However, they are often brought to moments of unique emotional intensity. In 1946, toward the end of his life in Graham's magazine, Poe set forth some personal ideas about the goals of literature in an essay he wrote called The Philosophy of Composition. 
As a personal observation, I'd say that it's clear that Poe didn't always follow his own advice for composition, but this essay lays out Poe's ideals for what literature should accomplish and likely explains how, in his best moments, he approached the writing process. Here are some ideas pulled from that essay. 1. Poe believed that the end of a narrative should be its dramatic high point, so much so he felt that it was pointless to begin writing a story unless an author could see its final moments with deep clarity. In the following passage from The Philosophy of Composition, Poe is going to use the word denouement to explain how a writer should approach a story's ending. Today we might use the phrase climax in the same way. Quote, Nothing is more clear than that every plot worth the name must be elaborated in its denouement before anything be attempted with the pen. It is only with the denouement constantly in view that we can give a plot its indispensable air of consequence or causation by making the incidents, and especially the tone at all points, tend to the development of the intention. 2. Beyond the centrality of the ending, Poe considered how each part of a story, from language to plot, might be directed toward developing one specific emotional effect on the reader. When Poe began to write a narrative, he focused on emotional elements as they would be experienced by the reader. In this, he combined plot materials with emotional effect, which later for him created the story. Quote, I say to myself, in the first place, of the innumerable effects or impressions of which the heart or intellect or more generally the soul is susceptible, which one shall I on the present occasion select? Having chosen a novel first and secondly, a vivid effect, I consider whether it can best be wrought by incident or tone, whether by ordinary incidents or a peculiar tone or the converse, or by peculiarity both of incident and tone. Afterward, looking about me, or rather within for such combinations of event or tone, shall best aid me in the construction of the effect. 3. To create this emotional effect, or what we might now call an emotional impression, Poe felt that a successful literary work, poems in particular, needed to be short enough to be read in one sitting so as the reader could remain in the glow of that emotional manipulation until the narrative's close. Quote, If any literary work is too long to be read at one sitting, we must be content to dispense with the immensely important effect derivable from unity of impression. For if two sittings be required, the affairs of the world interfere, and everything, like totality, is at once destroyed. I might point out that Poe also felt that longer literary works, such as a novel, might be broken into emotional units, like chapters, with one unit completed in one sitting. 4. Poe felt that poetry lent itself more to some goals, such as the elevation of the soul toward beauty, but he believed that prose, that is, a narrative arranged in sentences as opposed to lines, such as in fiction, was a better form for more powerful emotional pursuits. Quote, Passions, or the excitements of the heart, are, although attainable to a certain extent in poetry, far more readily attainable in prose. And lastly, number five, Poe also emphasized the way that a strong and vivid setting could amplify the emotional texture of a literary work. Beyond the elements listed in his essay, Poe clearly picks up on many core elements of romanticism in his work. His stories are focused on characters typically outside of society norms. Likewise, his plots present experiences that are far outside of everyday occurrences, such as murder, madness, and peril. Some of Poe's stories, such as The Fall of the House of Usher, pick up on the now familiar trope of a solitary character leaving town and moving out into the wilderness as a journey away from civilization and from, therefore, an organized sense of normalcy. 
But beyond these individual elements that Poe lists as important to literature, I'd say that his essay itself conveys how deeply he considered what American literature might accomplish, a level of thought about craft that likely surpasses that of his contemporaries, that a strong work of literature needs to have a clear sense of purpose even before words are placed on the page, and also a successful strategy for conveying emotional experience. Poe's creative work, and also his explanation of his work, also picks up and amplifies some key elements of romantic poetry, particularly in regards to extreme emotion. William Wordsworth, one of the key British romantic poets, rather famously explained in the introduction to his book, Lyrical Ballads, that he saw poetry as, quote, the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. The emotion is contemplated, till by a species of reaction that tranquility gradually disappears, and an emotion kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced, and does itself actually exist in the mind. And in Edgar Allan Poe's own work, both as a poet and as an early American short story writer, he, in his best efforts, saw his narrative works that, through careful mental planning, guided readers toward a spontaneous, if dark, overflow of emotion, an accomplishment that, in ways, is the lasting hallmark of his fiction. And now let us turn our attention to some specific stories assigned for class. <laughs> 